This is Pixelated Audio, episode 113, and today we're going to be listening to the music of Rackets and Rivals on the NES. Welcome to Pixelated Audio, a podcast focusing on game audio, its history, and the people behind it. We're your hosts. I'm Gene, and this is Brian. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, we got a fun episode today. Yeah, we, uh, we're doing something a little bit different today. We're trying out a shorter format. Yeah, a little bit different. So uh, we've been playing with doing some shorter episodes for a long time. We haven't really haven't really pulled the trigger on it yet. And uh, the thought was, we want to put out more content, and we have all these really great soundtracks there maybe like three or five tracks maybe not much sometimes even like two tracks and we thought like what's a good way to showcase these it's not like an expansion pack or not something that's you know just kind of glossing over the rest of the stuff but really kind of dive into the game and maybe a little bit of history about it and so we kind of were thinking like you know doing these mini episodes these smaller episodes would be a lot of fun you can listen to it on your you know your way to work and hear some great music and be done with it. And so uh, that's kind of the thought process here. Yeah, the NES is a great candidate. You have a lot of great soundtracks. Some of them are super short, and it's just, uh, you know, a lot of these episodes can spin out into an hour, hour and a half, two hours. You know, we try not to do anything at that two-hour mark, but, you know, you know, we don't have that many shows that are kind of on the shorter 30, 40-minute side. So in any case, we thought it would be good to try this short format just to see if we can get through a couple of shorter soundtracks, listen to some stuff that's a little bit... A little bit more free form, a little on the light side. Yeah, we do have some great content. Um, the thing is, though, um, you know, we're, we're saying that you know the the game audio, its history, and the people behind it. There is a problem with the soundtrack is that we don't really know the people behind it. Uh, <laughs> so we have some guesses, uh, but let's start off with um, the game. So, Reckons and Rivals was released in 1993 by Konami. It was developed by Konami, released by Palcom Software in Europe only. And so it never made its way to the States. It was never released in Japan. So this is kind of one of those odd titles, especially for the NES, considering the NES wasn't that popular to begin with in Europe. Yeah, there's really only a handful of European exclusive NES titles at all. Yeah. And uh, so the composers we have that we found in stuff like uh, VGMPF, I think they had uh, Tomoya Tomita and there was Hiroshi Takayasu. I could promise you that uh, Tomoya Tomita did not do this only because I asked him and he said no. It was it was a very one word answer. No, we found their credits on Parodius for the NES. Both of them are listed, and I think that's where a lot of this information is coming from. I see both of them listed for this game, but if uh, Tamita didn't do it, and we haven't gotten an answer from Takayasu, we're not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, so we're kind of it's kind of a general idea that maybe he did the work on it. I did ask him as well. Haven't heard back guy doesn't seem to be very active so we probably won't know uh at least until he checks his messages or something but if you listen to some of the comparisons between the um other tracks that they have listed as their credits there is a lot of similarities so i can see where that that original assumption came and uh it makes a lot of sense but the track they brought in the show was the title screen of rackets and rivals what'd you think well, they started to steal a few tricks from the Europeans there. You've got some arpeggios right right at the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, some of those really heavy Konami tricks, a real real strong use of the percussion channel. Yeah, I I mean, it's like they took a like a few different plays out of Kodaka's playbook, you know? Like it, there's a lot of a uh, a lot of strong DMC hits in there, and I think that leads to this just very powerful 
baseline section as well because they're able to do so much more with the uh, the triangle channel they're able to mess around with it a lot more because they don't have to worry about like that deep kick sound combining with the the noise channel that's a fun the- track pretty short uh, we're going to be getting into a couple other tracks which are a little bit more meaty but yeah. uh, it's a good one to start off the game you know nice punchy for a sports game, right? Yeah, for a tennis game. I mean, this could have been like turtle tennis, and I would have believed it. You know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle tennis. Yeah, I was getting a lot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle vibes off of this one. <laughs> well, real quick, let's talk about the developer and the publisher a little bit. Sure. So, as most of you know, Konami had their Ultra label in the U.S., and we've talked about them earlier on the show. It was kind of their their way of getting around the strict publishing limits in the U.S. So. They'd publish some of their big games in America under Konami and some of their smaller, more experimental games or, you know, the ones that are more geared towards an American audience under the Ultra label. And Palcom was basically the European equivalent of that. So they were both shell companies. They were both really just Konami. And so from about 1988 to 92, Ultra was making games for a variety of platforms, the NES, Game Boy, even DOS PC uh, and a couple of games on Amiga and C64, oddly enough. I did not even know that. Yeah, I didn't know that either, but it was just the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, which came out on both of those systems. But they were published in the U.S., so, you know, and those are historically European systems. So you've got games like Metal Gear, Gyrus, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Skate or Die, and Kings of the Beach. You know, a lot of a lot of these games that were very popular here in the U.S., and actually... Metal Gear is still, I think, more popular in the U.S. than it's ever been in Japan. <laughs> so. right. right. And Palcom published uh, a lot of games from 1990 to 1993 on the Game Boy and the all the way up to the Super Nintendo, actually. They did um, some games that were also published in the U.S., like The Adventures of Bayou Billy and Bucky O'Hare for the NES. They released a few games that didn't come out in the U.S., like Road Fighter, Crack Out, A Breakout Clone. And several Parodius and Twinbee games for the NES and Super NES as well. So like we mentioned earlier, Rackets and Rivals was only released in Europe, not even in Japan. And it was one of the last NES games to come out and one of the last released under the Palcom label altogether. Right. Now, I think Konami also did Tiny Toon Avengers 2. Maybe that was their last game in the US. I believe so. In Europe, this was pretty much one of the last. I think this was it. F1 Sensation and like one other thing. 93... Like, dates were still not super accurate in terms of when games came out, even then. Yeah, we were trying to think of what Palcom stood for. Maybe, like, PAL computers? I don't know. Yeah, probably. We, we were just saying, like, Ultra appeals to Americans, because it's like, oh, Ultra. You know, like, <laughs> whatever. So, they probably weren't thinking too hard when they came up with these alternate game company names. Yeah, and I was wondering, too, like, I wonder why they didn't keep Ultra in Europe. But maybe, maybe that makes sense. Maybe just Ultra just sounded dumb over there. I mean, it kind of sounds dumb now, but... It, it, well, know. it's like how, uh, you know, they'll have commercials here with British accents, and it's like, oh, it's sophisticated. But if you have an American accent in England, it's like, what's this trash? <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing here about uh, Ultra and uh, Palcom is that Ultra actually closed down their doors a lot sooner. I think Palcom made had a little bit longer in life, right? They closed around 94. Yeah, I mean, they did release a few games on Super Nintendo. I mean, they didn't have to. They probably could have just released it as Konami, but they kept it up for a few games. Right. So let's go ahead and jump into our next track. This is track two, or the main menu from Rackets and Rivals. That was track two, main menu from Rackets and Rivals. It's a simple, short track, but uh, gets the point across. It's a lot of fun. This is this is totally Ninja Turtles, man. Oh, as our friends at Forever Sound Version would say, they've got that percussion channel working overtime. Oh my god! <laughs> it's a no. Konami it, really punched up all of their late games, just like 
over the top, you know. Just... And and being such a late game too, you know, like they had figured out all the tricks and they knew how to use the sound hardware and like where they could, you know, kind of push it a little further. And so, uh, you know, these late games are a good testament to what like composers were you know kind of leaning towards you know that they hadn't done previously you know in the the early years of the the system's life yeah and outside of japan without the extra sound hardware they just had to make use of everything they had so you know we got some crazy sample channel stuff some really funky just distortion between waveforms on the the whatever the on the two square waves yeah yeah that distortion but sort of like wave it's almost like they're alternating yeah they're phasing a little bit yeah yeah yeah. it's it's kind of cool man i like that yeah yeah it's a very um like a surf rock ninja turtle vibe so yeah i'm going to be saying ninja turtles a lot in this episode just because (laughs) it's it reminds me of it so much so um rackets and rivals uh, the gameplay so let's talk about so let's talk about tennis a little bit gene so tennis i've played like 10 games of tennis in my life i took like three tennis lessons i wasn't very good i ran away not screaming but just sort of uh you know hidden another court (laughs) i played virtual tennis a lot on the dreamcast but that's about it maybe some mario tennis here and there i actually of all the sports games i find that tennis is not one that i really enjoy that much i mean if i'm gonna play tennis might as well just play pong that's That's fair enough yeah like you know these hyper crazy tennis like uh wind jammers or something no that that doesn't count that's super fun i love wind jammers it's true not that great at it but i love it uh but yeah it's a typical tennis game you get to you know have your character move around the court i mean (laughs) like i don't know how to explain other than that there's a bunch of different things you can do like lobs you know your straight hits and your power smash kind of things there's a few different modes. There's tournament mode, a free play mode, a training mode, and you can enter your initials and go through different simulated tournaments, I guess, where you can, you know, try to build your character all the way up to the end and get better stats and stuff like that. All the players in the game have their weaknesses, just like you would expect in a golf game, a tennis game, a baseball game, whatever. Um, Nothing too special about this other than the fact that you can go complain to the referee when you don't agree with uh, a decision that's been made. I feel like that should be part of any sports game. That's the reason why I loved uh, Blades of Steel on the NES is because you could get in fights. That was like the best thing about that hockey game. I mean, there's some cool stuff with the graphics. You have like uh, kind of a fake scaling effect when the ball is bouncing throughout the courts. You know, when it gets closer to the camera, it zooms in. So you like, you know, it's larger on the so screen. So I, I will raise you that and say that it's actually horrible. Oh? Because, yes, because the hit detection is so poor in this game because the way that the ball moves and the uh, the shadow the ball makes, you can't tell where anything is, and it makes it just very very difficult for a player to be able to see what they're what, what they're swatting at. You know what I mean? Style over substance. I guess they just <laughs> affected the playability of the game. I played it for all of like two minutes, and I figured I was just bad at it. So I I think you, <laughs> probably you and everybody else they're just like, oh man, I just must suck at this. <laughs> it's, it's just. Not really that good. So um, let's go ahead and get into our next track. We sure. Say? Yeah. And just, just so we're clear, there isn't any music during gameplay. So all of these tracks are just sort of in between. So. I know. That sure. makes the game suck even more. <laughs> uh, so this next track is called Next Opponent. So we'll take a listen to that and we'll be right back.
That was track three, Next Opponent, from Rackets and Rivals, and pretty much the reason why we picked this for, the, for this our first is, little short this show. This is a really good track, man. This is really, this is really fun. That breakdown, kind of, uh, what, like 15 seconds in? It's, oh, it's so funky. Oh, yeah, they're using the square waves for that really crunchy bass. And, 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 and they're all over the place, too, with this track. It's just, it's so much fun. It's so alive, and it doesn't make any sense for this game, but really well done. Well, first time I heard it, I'm like, oh, so that's where the Retro City Ransom folks stole their inspiration, <laughs> you know, because I know Vert loves kind of that early Konami sound, and this is basically that to this a T. Is, exactly. Good job, takeyasu um, <laughs> If if you actually did it. Good job to whoever actually did the score. We're not going to commit to who actually wrote it. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is just a really fun track. I think, um, why, don't we, why don't we take a second and listen to some of the channels and see what they're doing the uh interesting one obviously is the dmc channel i think the those samples are just so neat you want to listen to those yeah put that with the noise channel because those are usually working pretty close together yeah yeah now bring in the uh triangle channel going buck wild oh it's so good man that's cool you can just picture the bassist up on stage he's like nodding his head back and forth <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cool and here's those square waves coming in This is everything that I ever want to hear in a Konami track. Pretty it's much. so good, dude. Like it's this is the kind of music that just it, it's kind of it. I don't want to say it's like stupid fun, but it's just makes it, you just gotta crack a, a smile when you hear it. You know, it's so classic NES Konami sound. Even though I had never played this game before, and when would we have ever had a reason to? Right, and it's just <laughs> so it's so familiar though. You know, like when I, I keep bringing up. The Ninja Turtles, or I think you brought up, um, oh, what were you saying? Were you saying Gradius earlier? River City Rampage? Uh, River City. Retro City Ransom, which Retro is like is, is oh, the yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Nintendo Grand Theft Auto style game. They made like five years ago. Why but did I say River City Rampage? Because they're using words that sound like <laughs> all of that together, basically. <laughs> Oh, fun track. Uh, so uh, why don't we go ahead and get into the next one? We only got a few more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this next track is Match Results. So let's take a listen. Track four, match results from Rackets and Rivals. Yeah, short, um, little self-indulgent. I like it, though. Now, this track, there's something that stood out to both of us, and you said this exact same thing uh, when we were downstairs talking about it earlier, is that this one kind of sounds different from a lot of other, uh, from the other tracks. And so it sounds like almost like maybe this wasn't for the same game originally, or maybe it was composed by somebody different, but it does have some difference to it, even though it kind of retains that that central kind of uh, the instrument distribution, I guess. I mean, it, you mentioned it earlier, right? It has that Gradius sound. We were talking about this before the show. Like this one definitely sounds like a different strain of Konami music. Like it's clearly all in that same body, but it's not using... The percussion in the same way exactly right 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 so maybe there were two composers on this but we don't know which two yeah the other part of this too is because there's no music during the gameplay and it seems like such a rush job maybe this music wasn't intended for this game originally i mean this i wouldn't i wouldn't associate this kind of music with a tennis game not that a lot of game audio is 
you know, in parody with its um, visual counterparts, but it just kind of feels like this was not what it was intended for. I, I, are you getting that vibe? Almost none of the music really sounds like a tennis game music. Like, there's almost like a cliche. We've talked about this. What golf game music sounds like? It's very relaxed. Right, sort right, of, right. You know, you you don't get mad and throw the club. But I wouldn't picture this for like it's good music, but. It doesn't. I don't draw any association with tennis from it. This would be like beat 'em up kind of music, or yeah, like yeah, flesh out some of the tracks, and it could be thrown in a shoot 'em up or it, an action it, game or something. Right, right. But um, you know, it w- whatever they they put it out in Rackets and Rivals, and uh, so the what five people in Europe that got to actually play this <laughs> and and decided to purchase it. I don't. Maybe look. Maybe this was sold all over the place. But I'll tell you this that. Um, the struggle that we had with putting this episode together is there's absolutely no information on it. This game, we couldn't find a manual. We couldn't find, couldn't find the real composers like credited anywhere. Japanese websites, nobody cared because it never came out there. Um, never came out in the U S so there's no documentation there. And the websites that did have some information about it, um, were kind of linking to like a German website or I think there was a French website that had done a review from like 1993 when the game came out and everybody gave it really bad reviews anyway. So I don't think there was any incentive to kind of document it any better. No. And I read a recent review from like two or three years ago and it was this long article, which could be summarized as why did I even bother? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like- <laughs> yeah. There's one from a uh, skirmish frogs. Was that the one? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. He gave it an F or they gave it an F, uh, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure it does not stand for fun. And <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely one of those games that it's clear. They, they wanted to get some last NES dollars in Europe of all places where there were barely any dollars to be made on the system, but Hey, <laughs> here we are. Yeah. So let's get into our next track. This is track six tournament victory from rackets and rivals. That was track six from Rackets and Rivals called Tournament Victory. And uh, what a killer track. Those arpeggiated, well, everything, you know, the, <laughs> the bass tones, the, the the fast 16th note percussion. I love this kind of music. Uh, uh, me too. Oh, man. It's, I got to you know, we, we were talking up that, uh, with that second track that we played. Um, this might be the better one. This might be my favorite. I, I, I don't know. It's short. It's you know, like what, like a 20, 30 second loop, but this has like such an awesome groove. Do you want to listen to the sample and the bass and noise and stuff again? Let's listen to a few of the channels soloed out. I could listen to this all day. I know this is awesome. Bring in so, a few more channels. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so crunchy. Actually, hold on. Let's just listen to the sample channel. Oh, God. They're, they're so punchy. That is uh, all on the sample channel, by the way. Oh, yeah. Those Tom, toms. Tom Phil's snare kick. Ooh, yeah. Let's bring the bass back in. And then the uh, the squares. 
I like those glissandos too on the squares, just like wow, and got then the, drop off. It's got that Mario Death sound in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff, dude. I like it. Yeah. Oh, man. So great soundtrack, though. I mean, very short and rightfully so. You know, like there's no music during gameplay, so you got menu music. We got your title screen. But yeah, it's a really great soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, it was a short soundtrack, but they were clearly having a lot of fun. And uh, which brings us to our next and and our last point, which is. We mentioned we don't really know who the composers are, but we do have some credits for our best guest, which is Hiroshi Takayasu, who he has credits on sound for a lot of other Konami games like Crackout, which is not the Commodore 64 game. It's actually a port of a Famicom disk system game. It's that breakout clone we mentioned. Parodius, uh, Monster in My Pocket, Tiny Toon Adventures 2, and this game. I mean, he was also heavily involved in composing music for the Beat Mania and Pop and Music series almost right from the beginning He wrote some of the more memorable early Beatmania songs that probably got stuck in your head because there weren't that many to pick from. You had like Love So Groovy, Overdoser, Ska A Go Go, and Prince on a Star. Yeah, I remember many of those because I was really into Beatmania, the the original PlayStation, or the, I guess, port of the arcade version, right? But I was really into the PlayStation one. I have the pads, like they're just like sitting right right up there. Um, So a lot of those songs just bounce... around in my head like randomly like that ba, 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 da, 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 da. that's our, the bossa nova one right? our yeah. local arcade had a what is it a complete mix it was like the, the the final one that was kind of popular in american arcades and i played a lot of these early songs oh you were rock it you rock it uh at the beat mania dude i was watching you during Magfest, and uh oh no that was um california extreme that was pretty uh you're pretty pretty intense dude i was good i was not amazing i have friends that are much better than i am some that i actually played in tournaments and such oh my god you know i i i really got into beat mania for a while so you know that's that's that that's uh hiroshi takiyasu yeah and the thing is about him too if you listen to like monster in my pocket that soundtrack mirrors a lot of some of the um sample channel sounds that we're hearing on uh on this soundtrack so it might be might be some validity in uh, assuming he was a closer for Rackets and Rivals. Again, we can't be certain, so uh, maybe one day we'll find out. Yeah, if somebody wants to step forward and tell us that they wrote the music for this game, you know, give us some proof and we'll... we'll... Send us an email, contact at pixelatedaudio.com with all of your bio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hey guys, quick update here. We heard back from Takeyasu-san regarding his contributions to the game, and yes, he did compose several of the tracks. It's still a big question mark for the other composer involved, but at least we know some of the tracks were composed by Takeyasu-san. The only problem is he doesn't remember which ones, so I guess unless we play every track for him, uh, we'll never know. But at least we have a good idea now of who was responsible for the soundtrack. Let's get back to the show. Um, anyways, we have one last song to play, and this is kind of an interesting one. We watched a playthrough, and we got through a lot of it, and we couldn't find... Um, we found out where most of the tracks play, but we couldn't find one. It's an unused track in the game, and this could have been baked into the ROM. We were saying this is such a hack job, or such a rush job, that maybe they they thought they needed more music than they had, they just never used it, but I couldn't find it anywhere, you couldn't find it anywhere, so... Uh, we're titling our next track is unused yeah and here's the real tragedy you're playing this game with no sound with bad gameplay four hours five hours six hours you finally get to the end you're rewarded with like a 10 second long like cutscene with two images and it goes straight back to the title (laughs) so they were probably going to program it in it's like there's no time yeah there's no time just go back to the title use the same music whatever so this is track five which is unused and it's pretty mellow so i hope you guys like it thank you so much for listening and we'll see you back in a few weeks for the next episode
I wish I knew any famous tennis players from this era. Andre Agassi? I think that's probably the only one, right? Yeah, he's the only one I know, and that's probably from virtual tennis. Yeah. He was on there. Anna Kornikova was like 10 years later. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Oof. Good soundtrack. 